Vladimir Putin believes that the digital information space is a battlefield, yet we in the West are perhaps late to realize that fact. The rise of the internet in the 21st century has been accompanied by unprecedented levels of polarization, division, and coercion. At the same time, democracies are being hit by a huge range of different and rapidly evolving hostile state activities. Not all of them have their origins in Russia, though clearly many do, and the scale of that threat is only likely to increase in future. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe if you enjoy the materials we create and you enjoy our incredible guests. Do also please consider becoming a patron or buy me a coffee to support the work we do. Grigor Atanasian is an investigative journalist with the BBC. He was producer for the Trauma Zone documentary series by Adam Curtis, BBC Film, and the associate producer for Can't Get You Out of My Head documentary series, also by Adam Curtis. As part of the team that created the unique and powerful Trauma Zone BBC documentary, he was awarded a BAFTA for Specialist Factual Programming in 2023. Well, Talking of uh, sort of factualities, I hope that intro was correct and accurate. Brilliant. <laughs> Gregor, welcome to the channel. And we're going to talk about an extraordinary topic today, which is the Z bloggers. Now, what led you to uh, investigate this particular avenue uh, and create such a compelling piece of reportage or analysis on it? Uh, well, thanks for having me, Jonathan. Um in this project, I wanted to do two things. One is to look at Z bloggers, at the Russian pro war influences as a separate phenomenon of the Russian propaganda, because we oftentimes in the West, we tend to look at the Russian propaganda as a monolith, as somebody, as a, some unity entity which is united, but it's actually consists, it actually consists of separate, very different entities groups of people, financial, material interest, and ideological groups. But I also wanted to explore the ways of storytelling um, on, on the sort of borders of documentary filmmaking, uh, producing you know, uh, content for YouTube, which would be relatable and, and easy to, to access, especially to the younger audiences, and also disinformation journalism. Because uh, the idea of disinformation journalism as something reactive, right? We often, we often think of, you know, fact check when somebody, a politician some, sends, says something stupid or, uh, you know, or something that is wrong. And then a journalist spends a week fact checking it, pulling data, and then issues a fact check, which is great. But then the audience of that fact check is tiny, uh, absolutely dwarfed by the audience of the of uh, falsehood, which was, uh, you know, distributed by the Russian propaganda or a politician in the West or whoever, you know, um, anybody pretty much. And so what we wanted, our team at the BBC Global Disinformation Team, what we wanted to do is to tell stories about disinformation in the way that will make them compelling and interesting for, you know, wide ranging audiences which would not only include you know, Russia experts or Ukraine experts or people studying this, but people who probably don't know anything about the Z bloggers who are not spending the, you know, all day, every day on Telegram following these people, but who, who are interested in a question, why Russians are like that? Why a lot of Russians still support the war after knowing everything, uh, even if they don't know truth about you know, war crimes that Russian military is committing in Ukraine, the cost of war for Russia, even after mobilization, after cross-border attacks, after drone strikes, should have become quite very obvious, right, for, for the Russians. But but somehow it seems that it, it it is not yet there, right? And so people, a lot of people, I think, in the UK and globally in the world are asking, you know, what is going on inside Russia? And so we thought of this project as a way to show that you know, there is a group of people who are very smart in, in terms of how they use social media, how they produce content, and who work with the young Russian audiences to make them support this war, to make them go and fight in Ukraine, to make them, you know, subscribe to this worldview of Russia versus the West, uh, this, uh, you know, existential fight um, in which this invasion, this war is not a illegal aggression, which it is, you know, by 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 the definitions of most of the world, by is actually a defensive fight the way that these people frame it to 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 protect Russia from from the NATO proxy aggression. 
And there's so many interesting angles to follow up there. Let's start with fact checking one and then we'll get on to demographics. Because I think the demographics are incredibly important. You know, we're not talking about a TV audience here, which tends to be on average an older demographic. We're talking about online media. And I think right from the start, Vladimir Putin, and he stated as much, sees the information space as a hostile space, as a battleground, as an area that Russia needs to compete in and needs to defeat uh, its so-called adversaries in. Um, he is reputed not to use social media himself, um, so he probably doesn't really understand the cultural social media, but... What is your thoughts there about him seeing it as a sort of an extension of foreign policy, extension of uh, one could even call it, you know, the imperialist aggressive policies that his government is pursuing? Well, what we, we have certainly seen with the Z bloggers, with the pro-war influencers, that at some point in this war, in this full-scale invasion of Ukraine, there came a moment when the Kremlin and Putin himself had to acknowledge the influence. And it's an incredible trajectory for these people, because at the beginning, you know, in February 2022, they were still a very marginal voice. In radical and marginal voice in the Russian society. They've been there for ages on Telegram. You know, they were the ones who initially embraced annexation of Crimea and Russian invasion in the east of Ukraine, in the Donbas region. But, you know, they, and they wanted Russia to annex the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, oblast, and they wanted these regions to be part of Russia, and they actually wanted Russia to go and try and capture Kiev for many, many years. And even the Kremlin dismissed them as radical marginal voices. But when the invasion happened, so they were the ones calling for this total war in Ukraine for years, and they were the first to go there. They already had this relationship with the separatist pro-Russian uh, units in the Donbass. So they were embedded with them. They had exclusive access to the front lines, and they started pumping out this, you know, videos and the reports and Telegram, just short messages breaking, breaking, it's always breaking news, you know, flash, um, news flash from, from the front lines. And they sort of just grew, their popularity skyrocketed, really. You know, some of them had, you know, 70, 60,000 followers at the moment of the innovation. Now they have over a million. And they were helped hugely by the fact that the Kremlin banned you know, all the Western networks, you know, in Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, but also blocked almost in all the independent media, both the Russian one and the international, like the BBC. And so a lot of Russian people turned to Telegram to get their news and on, on the war itself, on the development of fights. And they've seen this, you know, people are sort of reporting from the front lines, from the Russian trenches almost, as, as the source of, of valuable information. And they actually proved, in some cases, to be a source of very valuable information. They were calling for mobilization for months before actually Kremlin decided to announce it. So if you're somebody in Russia, it's actually, you do, if you even if you don't support the war, if you disagree with them, it makes sense for you to follow them because they don't only report what they see, they try to influence the agenda from their nationalist, imperialist, pro-war uh, standpoint. And we see that the Kremlin listens to them and, um, you know, the Kremlin in itself, the recognition, the acknowledgement came when Putin gathered them in, in the Kremlin in June, and it was an extraordinary event, more than two hours on the record, him talking to them, allowing them to ask him questions that nobody else is allowed. One of them asked him, how is that the enemy, the Ukrainian drones, reached the Kremlin? And and um, he, in you know, in his turn, had this uh, favor to ask, which he quoted, he said, the the information space is a crucial battlefield, and I really need your help. I'm really counting on your help here. And, and it was really interesting because we saw how he addresses those war influences by their nicknames, pet names, saying Sasha instead of Alexander, Zhenya instead of uh, Evgeny. But when the turn came, they were also just normal state media reporters and editors in the room. He didn't know any of those names. People from the first channel, from the VGDRK, he just knew those that the bloggers. That's interesting. So he wouldn't have got that from one of his little um, brown folders that the FSB is supposedly prepares for him. Do you think he actually watches some of these materials then, or do they prepare some of these Z Patriot materials for his consumption? Um, well, I, I I don't have a knowledge of that. Um, and I don't want to speculate, but it was clear that he's familiar with their work and that he somehow 
by the way that he behaved and talked to them, that they are somehow in the system allowed to do more than regular people, whether, you know, state media or independent media, because people are jailed for saying what they say. But because they're coming from a pro-war sort of position, this is pro-war dissent, pro-invasion sort of dissent, then somehow they're allowed to do more. And one of, of the focuses of our investigation was why and how they're allowed to criticize the military, you know, because as you know very well, there have been many, many criminal articles, you know, panel articles just made up to, to jail people for criticizing the war, like discrediting the army or spreading fakes about the army. But they do it from the Russian government standpoint. They do it almost every day and they get away with that. So if you're Ilya Yashin or Karim Morza, you're not going to get away with it. But if you're Pegov or someone, you can say certain things. Now, we'll explore the limits of that uh, speech because... It clearly has limits, and if they're overstepped, uh, bad things can can happen to people. But let's tackle this question of demographics, because in my simplistic understanding, I'm assuming that they appeal to a much younger demographic, um, and those people who perhaps previously might have consumed more liberal Western media sources. But am I mistaken? Uh, are they actually penetrating a lot broader demographic of the population, um, as you say, with the increase of their popularity since the full scale war. Well, we haven't done any, you know, studies on that, but there are several facts which point to them being specifically focused on the younger demographics. First is the, the embrace of Telegram. Telegram is the most popular app for people under 24 in Russia, not just a messaging app or a social network. It is the most important application on their phones by far now, right? Um, you know, we see we see um, the way that they frame, they film their content. It is very fast paced. It is very bold brush. You know, sometimes they try to be funny. They also don't shy away from using internet memes, anime, all sorts of Western culture, which is being sort of appropriated and then repackaged in support of the war. And all this, it is almost a subculture, and it's a youth subculture. The Z bloggers, it's it's not for the you know people over a certain age. You have to be in. You have to share this, you know, you know, terms and codes and and symbols. And and they they have a sort of counterculture um, element to them. But but also of course they they support the, the state and the government. And you mentioned the military and the fact they're pro-war gives them a certain license. Now, they have been or there has been instances where they've been extremely critical of the formal military, of the Ministry of Defense, of tactics, of quality of equipment. And of course, when there are substantial losses or some kind of incident where the Ukrainians um uh, for instance, over Christmas, the barracks that was that was destroyed, and there but many instances like this where you could say the Ukrainians have gained really strong PR um, out of battlefield successes. You tend to have this this upswing of Z blogger uh, anger, uh, a lot of it directed at the Ministry of Defense. At the same time, they are embedded with the Russian army. Um, do we have a sense of how this sort of uneasy relationship works in practice? Because you know, it must be quite a dangerous balancing act, uh, criticizing the army when, let's face it, the army are the ones with the guns and have the access to the front line. It's it's difficult to understand how that works, actually. It is indeed a strange relationship, a balancing act, as you said. Um, you've uh, gave an example of the strike on Makivka barracks um, on the New Year's Eve when, you know, at least 80 Russian servicemen were killed and the Ministry of Defense tried to cover it up. And the Z bloggers, the pro-war influencers, were the one who prevented that from being covered up and who, who called for a full investigation. And this is how we know. And we at the BBC and, you know, other Western media quoted them quite a lot at that time. And we actually do, you know, oftentimes quote, quote them because they, they would be the only voice on the Russian official side to admit losses or setbacks. Um, but they also do spread a lot of disinformation, which we could get to later on, because it's important. Because sometimes, because we quote them so 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 much, we forget to to pinpoint that part of the equation that they they are major source of disinformation. But 
It's interesting because when you ask this question, why are they allowed to say that generals are corrupt and incompetent and their strategy is timid and outdated, something that, as you said, Ilya Yashin or other people would be jailed for, um, we don't know. But what we see is at all the critical junctures in this way, in this invasion, they left their criticism and disagreements behind and they rallied behind the military and the Kremlin, whether that would be mobilization, which was very unpopular in the society, but they supported it and they told, you know, Russian youth, you should go and fight, you will be taken care of, they will give you, uh, you know, good equipment. And if you're not given good equipment, tell us and we'll fix it and stuff like that. And then, you know, if you take an example of Prigozhin's mutiny, a lot of these people were uh, embedded with Wagner. A lot of people had per personal relationships with Evgeny Prigozhin or with other Wagner commanders. They spent time with them. They were in the field with them. They had exclusive access to them. Some of them were paid by Wagner. And we know that because of the leaked documents published by the, the CIA Center and other Russian investigative journalists. But when Prigozhin announced his mutiny, some of them just went completely silent. Others rallied behind the Ministry of Defense and the Kremlin. You know, nobody um, really uh, supported Wagner and Prigozhin in this mutiny. So as long as the government, I feel like, can rely on their support at all the critical points, this dissent is seen as not really threatening to them. Um, and I think we got a good sense of the red lines in the in case of uh, Igor Strelkov Girkin, because actually in the, in the, in our project in our um, short film uh, there is an interview with Alexander Kotz, one of the top war influencers. Uh, he is a correspondent for a pro-government newspaper, but also has his Telegram channel with over six hundred thousand followers and. Um, he, when I asked him, why are you allowed to criticize the military and others, um, you know, go to jail for that? He said, oh, no, what are you talking about? Everybody can criticize the military. Look at Strelkov. He does it every day. But then Strelkov overstepped later on because um, he he went as far as calling on Putin to resign. He said Putin should go. And the same day, the FSB launched a criminal case against him. He's now under arrest, awaiting trial. So that shows the limits of the dissent. That's one very clear red line. I think that's been apparent uh, to many, hasn't it, for some time that uh, you can criticize the Chinovniki, you can criticize the, you know, the 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 governors of an oblast or whatever. But the minute you 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 question the czar and his authority, you're 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 done. I think that is a clear red line. Does it also not suggest that rather than being independent voices so even though they, there's a great amount of variety amongst the z bloggers you have different tones different points of view underpinning it all they are still part of the same machine they're part of the same sort of governmental framework of creating a message disseminating a message because if they were a genuine organic phenomenon you'd get a lot more perhaps pushing out at the so-called unacceptable edges. But underlining it seems that there's a very clear editorial framework. They all understand it. Um, let's tackle the editorial aspect first and what we know about that. And then we'll talk about funding, because at the end of the day, following the money might be the best way to understand whether they are an organic phenomenon or uh, really just a part of the huge state machine. Well, I actually wanted to talk about it because this was a very important part of our project. We wanted to look not only at the ideology and their messages, but also at the sort of material base of what they do and material motiva motivation behind it. This is in no way to suggest that we say that they only do it for profit. We don't know that and we don't have any reasons to doubt the nationalist imperialist, ag ag imperialist agenda and ideology, but we also wanted to sort of add this element to the equation because it's always being ignored and i think it's very important to, to to understand when you're trying to understand people's motivations to look at what is driving them financially and sort of what is their self-interest we did a little bit of um undercover online undercover work where we post as hotel owners and try to place ads in 12 major uh, pro war influencer channels uh, from um, War Gonzo, the most popular one perhaps, with over a million subscribers, to the smaller ones, Wagner affiliated, the one, the Gray Zone, which is an anonymous channel linked to the Wagner group, always publishing exclusive Wagner content. Uh, 
they have half a million over half a million uh, subscribers and they we were given quotes from you know five hundred dollars to seventeen hundred dollars per one ad per post and uh, many of them do uh, at least one ad per day so when you multiply that by 30 or whatever you give and you get an enormous sum especially for Russia you know with the uh, median monthly salary of uh, you know six hundred dollars and this this are the official numbers which probably don't reflect the reality and so uh, they managed to monetize the war and they managed to make this war very beneficial to them they get they got uh you know fame they got official recognition Putin gave them medals some of them were uh, appointed to official positions Alexander Kotz was put on the presidential human rights council or the irony of that um some of them Semyon Pegov and others were put on the working group on mobilization also by Putin's degree but they also got amazing money and this is just the tip of the iceberg this is just the open part which happens on the internet and where we can find out the sums they are getting uh, I, you know Ekaterina Shulman a leading Russian political scientist says that they are also in the pay of the Ministry of Defense some of them and some we were at least in the pay of Wagner Group while it existed, maybe not anymore. Um, and definitely that is not just your assumption. It is based on reporting by several Russian investigative outlets uh, who analyzed leaked materials. So it's it's a money-making machine, Telegram. And that leads to an extraordinary uh, idea and one which you sort of hint at earlier, which is that the extremism of Russia's full-scale um uh, aggression um partly of course is driven by putin his delusions his global ambitions but it's also perhaps being driven by the requirements of this media ecosystem it also suggests that ending the war negotiating an end to the war uh anything except an internal conflict is not in the commercial interests of the majority of the information space that we're talking about here it's almost as if it's a it's a sort of feedback loop that leads to an economic logic behind endless war and anything else means that these bloggers will be less profitable because without war they can't criticize domestic politics they can't criticize um you know domestic issues like the economy poverty etc war is is a great sort of monetization topic for them therefore the war has to go on well they say that the war must go on i don't know what drives them is it you know just pure profit or ideology maybe both i think but but they sort of ideologically they also can't agree to any ceasefire, to any negotiations, to any peace, because they see that and they convince themselves and now trying to convince the Russian society that this is an existential fight, right? That as long as Ukraine is independent, sovereign state, not a Russian vassal state, it, it's it's a mortal danger to Russia and it's a total you know, NATO proxy against Russia. So they would be the ones who will be the loudest voices against the war and, and all the critical jun junctures when we were getting even a step close to that, they were extremely paranoid about Kremlin, you know, betraying their cause. They hated the Green Deal. They were the loudest voice in Russia against the Green Deal because all the independent voices were squashed already. And the independent voices actually, you know, didn't criticize Green Deal so much because, you know, any sort of any step towards peace is, is seen as positive. But but for them, that was a grand betrayal. And there were a lot of conspiracy theories about liberal elites around Putin, um, you know, trying to uh, manipulate him into doing that. And I think Prigozhin's death was a really interesting development and I liked seeing it unroll and develop in the Z channels because a lot of them think that it was ordered and he was killed by somebody high up in Russia. Some people point the finger to Putin indirectly, especially anonymous channels who can afford to do that. The sort of the more famous people who are right under their own names, they sort of you know speculate about the elites around Putin, but whoever it is, it's not good for them because it shows that, you know, even the most efficient, effective Russia's war manager, the one who was less corrupt in terms of, uh, you know, 
fighting the war and putting all the resources towards his goals on the battlefield, which Prigozhin was um, from the Russian standpoint, right? Even he is, uh, in just, uh, you know, he, he dispensable really when he becomes a tiny bit less loyal than the Kremlin wants him to. So anybody can be replaced and exchanging and, and uh, the cost to the war, to the cost to the invasion doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is loyalty to the ruling group and which sort of poses a lot of questions for their future, right? Because if there is a ceasefire, you know, at the end to this war ever, you know, what future is there in the new system for them? And and surely, and this is the bit that uh, that, that is difficult to understand, you know, anyone who uh, reads the history of the Bolshevik Revolution knows that in the end it turns and, and consumes its own. Um, and this is sort of what we're talking about here. And there's plenty of evidence with the death of Daria Dugina, um, Vladimir Tatarsky and many others that, um, you know, if we discount... Uh, the Ukrainian special um, intelligence agents, which, which is not impossible, but if we discount those and, and, and say that potentially it's more of a sort of internal uh, issue, that must be a warning to many of these people, as you say, that they're they're useful now, but none of them are indispensable if the narrative or the requirement changes. Well, um, I I don't know who is behind the killing of Vlad Tatarsky and Dari Dugina. I know that um, a lot of people in Russia who were, as you say, seen as not loyal, not loyal enough, dangerous, um, probably too loud voices against the government, against the Kremlin, ended up being killed or disappeared. They know that, uh, you know, some of them are smart people and they understand that. And I think they are worried. And there is a palpable sense of paranoia, which we mentioned previously about Kremlin betraying the cause. And they always see signs of that. Even in the fate of General Surovikin, who was also seen as an effective war manager, he was probably too close to Wagner and Prigozhin for the Kremlin, and he disappeared, and the Kremlin never said where he is. But the Financial Times, other personal publications report that he was under investigation, under arrest. When he reappeared miraculously last week um, you know, in Russia, it was a liberal journalist, Ksenia Sobchak, who first reported and published this photo. And once again, it was such a blow for them that somebody whom they see as a traitor to their nation and somebody who is against the war is given exclusive access to this piece of news. Is that a sign that the Kremlin is not on their side anymore? Once again, it, you know, makes for a good night of speculation on, on Telegram. I mean, that, that's a classic tactic, isn't it, of uh, divide and rule and uh, creating uh, competition amongst, uh, I mean, dare I say it, there was a similar strategy in the Third Reich where the same task would be given to multiple minions and then, you know, they're too busy fighting each other. That's a, a classic technique. Let's turn to what we can or can't know. I mean, I, I, I tend to speculate a little too much, but when we look at the editorial practices, do we know what the structure of editorial planning is because as we said these z bloggers you know they'll talk about a wide variety of themes they clearly have some leeway to discuss certain things in their own way but do they broadly speaking get sort of editorial directive from some kind of ministry of information um is it comparable to the kind of perhaps editorial sessions that might go into planning say the Solovyov show or uh, when margarita semenyan decides what to say etc um do we know anything at all about how that whole structure works um that helps enforce the framework or even down to the planning of individual episodes or monthly output well, I think in my interview with Alexander Kotz, I asked him about his relationship to the government and to the Ministry in Def on Defense. And on the record, he was very open and saying that they have a private channel with the Ministry of Defense, that some of the criticism they, you know, directly can communicate without making it public, that they talk and have a, he said, a mutually beneficial cooperation with the Ministry of Defense. I think that you know, says a lot about their practices. And just looking at their channels, at their content, you will see that people with very different divergent interests and pet causes will at times just all post basically the same message, sometimes just copy pasted message, right? And you sort of wonder where it's coming from. But I think that a lot of times when we think that something is being forced on them, maybe they just all care about it. 
I have this sort of theory um, of my own, if you allow me to speculate a tiny bit, which I'm not really supposed to do, but I think this is a harmless speculation. I think that uh, they actually are a kind of a civil society inside Russia. We know of a Russian civil society as in human rights defenders, opposition, independent press, which shares liberal values, is against Putin and is against the war and is in tune with the West and Ukraine largely. Um, well, I think there is a parallel civil society which is embodied in that that pro-war movement. Um, they are in, in the bat with, with the government, they're in bat with, with the state, so they are not civil society per se, but they have signs of grassroots movement. They do fundraise for the army and you know thousands of just regular you know people who are not well off, they will still send their ruble to, to, to buy drones for the frontline units. They have this, you know, sort of civil cult of the Donbas martyrs like Motorola, Givi, all the field commanders, terrorists in Ukrainian view um, who were killed. We don't know who killed them, actually, because the official version is that it was the Ukrainian intelligence agents. But I think those that bloggers don't believe it themselves. And so they, they celebrate this Givi, Motorola, Zaharchenko, other Donbas heroes in the view, terrorists in the Ukrainian view. And um, they just have this uh, really strong belief in what Ukraine should be, how it should be under Russian rule, that the Kremlin never actually endorsed. The Kremlin loves to leave, you know, leave it options, um, you know, sort of to, to be vague on some of the stuff, because if, you know, it's more um, at some point, it, it, it leans towards negotiations or reframing it. Uh, they don't Kremlin is not very big on policy, weirdly, right? For for the government and for the state. These people have a very clear idea of what should be banned Ukrainian language, for example. And when they see Ukrainian language, for example, still allowed somewhere in Russia where there were Ukrainian language schools, they are all really against it and they say, Oh, this should be banned. They also have this paranoid war on the Russian, you know, liberal elites. They see a lot of people in the Russian government as uh, harmful to their cause, and they try to sort of rally against them. You know, the Kremlin keeps them in check and still allows for them for some of those, you know, suspected liberals to be in the government. But but I think that there is an element. There is Kremlin meddling, and there are, as they admit, direct channels of communication. But there is an element of ideology behind all this. I think this is a fascinating point because um, whereas we could label it as a sort of anti-civil society because it is dedicated to really a horrific objective, nonetheless, it's almost like some oil in the machine, isn't it? You know, without this, there wouldn't be a feedback loop to point out the deficiencies of the military at the front for Putin and others to, there'd be no channel for them to learn about this or even react or try to improve things. And we do have some evidence that the Russian military is starting to learn certain lessons on the battlefield. So this is a crucial, perhaps, communication mechanism that a monolithic autocracy um, would, wouldn't have. Uh, that That's perhaps one explanation for it. Um, I, th I think the... Um... <laughs> What they call FPV drones, first-person VU drones, um, are a great example of that. The, the you know, Vladlen Tatarsky, somebody who fought on the Russian side in Ukraine, he he was a former convict. He spent time in the Ukrainian jail for for a bank robbery. He then joined the separatist Russian forces and fought in in the initial R Russian invasion of 2014. Then he became a war correspondent, what they call in Russia. Of course, he was not a journalist. He was a propagandist and a war influencer. His whole shtick was about first-person view drones. He realized early on that Ukraine is much better, much smarter in some of the, uh, you know, the, the ways it conducts the war, even with small resources. And he was sort of evangelist for the first-person view drones in Russia. And he was raising funds for them, and he was trying to convince. He went to Moscow and talked to officials saying, this is what we need. And then when he was killed um, in April, other people around him and other war influencers also embraced this cause. And now we're seeing more and more of this F FPV drones on, on the Russian side and videos from them. So actually, the Ministry of Defense was sort of forced into adopting them by the pro-war propagandists. And 
it, it's concerning as well because if we look and, and I, you know, I spoke to many people in the 90s about their experience of, you know, sitting through classes of Marxist Leninism, for instance, and, you know, whether this was just sort of wishful thinking or, or telling a story, but everyone said that literally nobody believed this stuff. You know, you have a, a story that the state has created, you have an alternative reality that you inhabit, but no one really buys into. Um with the Z bloggers and the Patriots, you again have an alternative reality, which may be very different from the one we perceive in the West. The pernicious aspect, however, is that perhaps what they're selling or the reality that they're creating is far more attractive. You know, the historical mythology of Russian imperialism that it's built on. Actually, you know, if you're sitting in a patriotic class, you wouldn't necessarily know whether your fellow students are actually buying into this or not. And there's a risk that many of them actually are. So is this a far more dangerous, far more pernicious kind of alternative reality that is built in this information space? Well, I think so, because the underlying, as you said, us versus them, the underlying principle of all these ideologies, weird kinds, because some of them are more on this sort of communist nostalgia trip, others are Russian nationalism as a Russian national nation state for white Slavic Russians, more uh, towards neo-Nazism, others are more of a you know, towards the imperial view in which Russian empire should be restored, it should be tolerant of other religions and peoples of all sort of, you know, skin colors, but the idea was that it would be all a new Russian empire, but they all, all them are united by this underlying idea of us versus them, the knee-jerk reaction of xenophobia and, um, you know, tribalism, which is still, I think, really the strongest force that drives so many violent ideologies and wars and conflicts across the world, uh, because it just taps into uh, fears and insecurities that we all have. And uh, yeah, it's world, worlds away from the boring, you know, Marxist Leninism lessons in which you had so many, you know, weird terms like dialectic materialism and, um, you know, uh, German 19th century philosophy. This is much more fast paced. These are cool videos, you know, with drones, with fire, with, you know, pretty girls, you know, fighting, jumping out there under fire. And it's just much more um, geared towards being binge worthy and to towards going viral on social media. And that raises a, a, another interesting idea because, of course, conscription and the uh, pressures of going to the front are a lot less for people who are, let's say, in the proto-middle class in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Katerinburg, and so on, you're far more likely to end up on the front if you are a minority from an impoverished area of Russia. But this information sphere, am I wrong in thinking it's very much geared up to this urban, uh, sort of quite well-educated audience, sort of, uh, as you say, sort of youth cool audience, to an extent, it creates the impression of a kind of bread and circuses. Uh, you know, if we're talking about the third Rome, this is partly what it seems Russia is becoming. It's a, it's a real life blood and gore entertainment to keep the urban audiences uh, distracted from politics. Um, it, it definitely feels like when you see, especially when you look at those channels and you see this, it's an endless stream of gruesome videos, drone strikes, uh, you know, strikes, uh, rockets and bombs falling on the Ukrainian houses, which are being glorified and they gloat and they celebrate destruction of, you know, whole cities in Ukraine. And they never admit to any of the Russian war crimes, but somehow they just, they, they just, they're happy when they see this. And, um, it's it's really ter terrible in the way that this war is probably the most, um, you know, televised uh, broadcast online. There are, you know, millions of videos and endless hours of it. Um, and yet, what is interesting to me, we understand very little about what is actually going on. So all these videos, they are not very valuable in terms of gaining insight, really. You mentioned earlier as well this this really sort of fascinating point as well. You know, we tend to latch on to the Telegram channels and see it as a manifestation of a pluralistic kind of society. And I think that's probably a misinterpretation. 
However, you have said that they're a curious mixture of telling truth to power and conveying truths as a kind of feedback mechanism, but also they're a conduit for a massive amount of disinformation as well. So, you know, how does that work? Is it a conscious effort to mix the two up? And is it part of this sort of uh, postmodern Russian propaganda, which isn't to convince you of something, but is to actually make you disbelieve in the concept of objective truth and reality? Well, I think it's definitely one of the most successful disinformation techniques, because if you just spread disinformation, it will be, you know, quite clear to your audiences, because you can, you know, if you're on all day, every day, people will see it. But if you mix it, you know, the old Soviet propaganda tactic, six, six is, uh, sorry, the old Soviet propaganda tactic, 60 to 40, in which the 60% of what you say is more or less factual, and then 40% is the agenda, the false agenda that you want your audience to buy into. And I think this is very close to it because we see them sometimes reporting Russian losses, sometimes quoting the Western sources, the Western media, which abandoned Russia, they will still quote some of them. So you get an idea if you just go on those channels and sp and don't look too close, you get an idea that it's more or less balanced, decent, some, especially if you're in Russia and your worldview is... Um, you know, shaped around um, government media, especially if you used to watch TV. When you go on Telegram, Telegram is a is a breath of fresh air. It seems so you know so much more independent and balanced and impartial than everything that is being told on the TV. So you sort of you start to think, you know, maybe you know maybe that's what they do. Maybe maybe they're fair. Maybe they're balanced. But then they sort of all have this weird agenda that they're trying to sell you, and we wanted to have a case study of that in our project, and that's why we brought this uh, staged video of uh, you know allegedly Ukrainian soldiers mistreating civilians for speaking Russian. And then we geolocated that to Makivka, a suburb of Donetsk, which was occupied by the has been occupied by pro-Russian forces since 2014. There are many inconsistencies in this video. They all suggest that the video was staged, that it's a fake. It was spread by many of those that bloggers. It's quite emotional. It sort of once again has this knee-jerk effect onto you. And I know people whose moms and relatives and friends in Russia who buy into propaganda, send them and said, you know, oh, you care about Ukraine so much, but look at what they're doing with their own civilians. So it gone really viral. And we also saw Russian diplomats and Russian embassies across the world post in this video, though it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a fake, it's staged. And that's what they do a lot. And this taps into another worrying aspect, doesn't it? Which is the militarization of youth. It's creating an environment where people have a heightened sense of threat. Um, they see Russia as a sort of isolated fortress that is surrounded by enemies and so on. Um, so people who are of school age are now sort of imbibing this atmosphere through patriotic classes and through patriotic education in schools. There's a new textbook which has just been released which is very much building on the sort of mythologies that uh, justify the war, according to the Russian government. And then they tune into Telegram, which appears to be a kind of organic information space. But actually, it's very much in tune with what they may also be experiencing within, say, the context of the classroom. And another extraordinary thing you've got in the uh, documentary is the idea that not only are these Z, Z patriots sort of celebrities online, they're also doing offline lectures. They're going to bookshops. They're going to youth clubs. People are actually going to see them and hear them. Um, that also creates the illusion of a, a fixed reality as opposed to a, a manufactured reality. Well, very much so. I think every time when you're doing as a journalist something about people who are spreading disinformation about what they call bad actors in our journalistic lingua. We are not talking about, you know, Nicolas Cage. We are talking about people spreading disinformation. So these bad actors, you always have to ask yourself, is it worth highlighting them? Is it worth putting a spotlight onto them? Are we not just giving them a platform? And for this project, I think there were two factors for us which convinced us to do this. One is that Putin himself asks for the help and acknowledge their role. 
And the other one that they have a genuine massive following, not just online. These are not just bots. This is not astroturf and what they call, right? The the uh, illusion of popular support, whereas it's all artificial. They are genuinely popular and people show up to see them. And actually, if you go through their channels, you can see quite a lot of video of young Russian men uh, in the front lines saying, I watched a lot of videos by Vladimir Tatarsky, or I watched a lot of war guns videos, and I decided to go and fight. And we just talked about stage videos. I think this ones are not staged. I think this ones are genuine. And I think that people, some people do buy into it and go and fight. And they even have things like merchandising and they have the whole thing that goes along with that, don't they? Well, some of them really are not individual bloggers anymore. They're like a small, uh, you know, brand of, you know, rock band in a way that they have merch, they have um, admins people who manage the advertising revenues, who uh, negotiate those advertising agreements. Some of them still do, even the biggest ones still, still do it in person. Others employ other people to do that. So they are, you know, celebrities and influencers in the way that other people are selling or pushing beauty products on the internet. The, their product is war. And let's, uh, let's probably sort of um, end with what might seem like speculation, but... What happens if the central government weakens in Russia or, adversely, the authoritarian slide increases and uh, there's more pressure to bring the Zed bloggers under control? I mean, how precarious is their existence at the moment and where do you think it might go? Well, I think that um, if we take the first scenario that you mentioned, if the central authority crumbles, then I think it will be um, a sort of civil war. And I don't want to say it will be a full civil war, but it will be a sort of war, a struggle between these two civil societies, one real civil society, another anti-civil society, the anti-war and pro-war camp. And now the pro-war camp, the Z-bloggers, the pro-war influencers are, of course, dominant, especially in the information sphere, because the rules are... Uh, you know, unfair, and they are helping them, and the state is rigging the game towards them. But once, you know, the authority crumbles, we shall see who will be more successful, who will be more viral, who will get, you know, who will win sort of hearts and minds of the Russian people. If Russia goes down the way of more authoritarian rule and dictatorship, um, and especially the war starts to go the other way, the way that Russia doesn't want it to go, I think a lot of people will have from this influences to show their true colors. And we will see who is actually doing this for the idea, who genuinely believes in this idea of existential war against Ukraine and the West, and who was just doing it, you know, for the money, for the fame, for the official positions, because the choice will be uh, very, very, very urgent for them, because the government will reward those who will be able to embrace the new party line and punish those who will go against it. And we see that in Solovyov, don't we? I mean, he was pro Prigozhin until Prigozhin became the bad guy. And then he just flipped his narrative almost overnight. Um, and, you know, he's something of a showman. I mean, he's a very toxic individual, but he's very, very capable communicator. I wonder whether, you know, all the Z bloggers will be able to, uh, to flip in quite the same way. Um, Certainly online audiences who are seeking authenticity, that may be a, a flip too far for, for many of them. Well, these people, they pride themselves on, on being not like Solovyov, and they ridicule Solovyov and other figureheads on the TV saying these are clowns because of how they can flip, as you said, and they see themselves as genuine pro-war, you know, pro-cause voices, but we shall see how, how true is that if, if, if the situation worsens for Russia. Well, this has been incredibly fascinating, Grigor, and I'm going to, of course, put a link to your uh, documentary into the uh, description of this video. I strongly encourage people to sort of watch that, but also, of course, Trauma Zone and the uh, other uh, series that you've been a, 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 a contributing part of, they are all deeply fascinating. They add to an understanding of what's going on, which is crucial for our times. Again, it's a huge privilege. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me.